it's not beginner friendly anymore per se okay and i wouldn't say that drop shipping is not feasible it's just more like uh you as the business owner you need to be a better entrepreneur and uh, it's either you provide more value to your customers so you sell more expensive stuff and charge them more so you can uh, basically cover the cost right or you can uh, di- diversify the traffic source away from facebook as well so in terms of biggest industry change per se i would say that is the biggest one yeah Jonathan Ng, you're looking good. You're sounding good. It is good to have you back on Economics. How are you doing this fine evening? All right, I'm doing fine. Thank you, Joseph, for inviting me back. Yeah, uh, happy to have you back. Really, I mean, not that there's uh, there's any uh, exclusivatory behavior going on. Happy to have uh, everybody back, but it, it especially means a lot to know that people were happy enough with their first time here that they want to come back and want to share um, some more of that knowledge. So. Uh, it's it, it's great to see you again. And also, um, I, I guess the last time we recorded too, I think that was just when we were doing uh, audio only, but we had all this technical stuff going around in the background. And so taking it upon ourselves to uh, to up our game, the connection's good, everything's smooth. And yeah, let's, uh, let's just jump into this. So uh, as always, I like to count how long it's been since the last time that I had my guest on. And it has been six months, give or take. Mass, not my strong suit. Um, so, and, and I always want to start with a, a great question about that um, window of time. And I also want my audience to just keep in mind that at no point do I want uh, to use my guest time just to, you know, recover the territory that I recovered last time. So I always encourage people to check out the previous episode, get yourselves all caught up, pausing so you have a chance to do that. Okay, great. Welcome back. Um, so, in the last six months, uh, on the top of your mind, what would you say has been some of the largest changes or some of the most significant differences, um, whether it's something that you've identified specifically with your business or even in e-commerce at a uh, at a larger scale? I think you talk to other people on the podcast as well, right? And then everyone's just, uh, are they, a, lot of the, a lot of them mentioned iOS 14 and stuff. Yeah. So I think that's a big issue. Uh, so I, I'll be honest with you, right? Like my, some of my clients are affected, yes. And then it's very scary because like, if your business entirely runs on paid advertising and then you just wake up and like 20, 30% of revenue is just gone and you just don't know what to do about it, right? And because uh, especially if you're selling physical product where there's risk involved, right? And especially if the COX is uh, very expensive, right? It's very expensive to ship out to the customer. There are no re- refunds, stuff like that, right? Then your margins uh, become thin. So I think that's the first thing uh, that came to industry and kind of affected everybody. But after a while, you start uh, realizing what, what works and what doesn't work, right? So uh, I think the emphasis more on understanding that you have a front end offer that you can liquidate on your ad spend and then on the back end, you know what to monetize. I think those companies will still uh, thrive a lot. Uh, and also I was talking to like, uh, like really, really big time guys, right? And what they're telling me is like, okay, uh, we are willing to go uh, 0.5X, 0.6X ROAS on the front end and basically just burn cash. Um, and they're just willing to uh, play the LTV back end game. So I think in terms of um, the industry is getting uh, more, it's not beginner friendly anymore, per se. Okay, and I wouldn't say that dropshipping is not feasible. It's just more like uh, you as the business owner, you need to be a better entrepreneur. And uh, it's either you provide more value to your customers, so you sell more expensive stuff and charge them more so you can uh, basically cover the cost, right? Or you can uh, di- diversify the traffic source away from Facebook as well. So uh, in terms of biggest industry change per se, I would say that is the biggest one. Yeah, and I'm already, I'm already seeing rumblings of like an iOS 15 update as well. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I just I just picked up on that and here, here or there. It, it seems to me that this one was a significant change just because it was a whole um, reconfiguration. So it was almost like like gerrymandering, but uh, in regards to uh, traffic and how people are using using their devices. Um, so I actually wanted to, to fixate on this for, for, for a little bit because I think this is fascinating. So in you know in in your in your position um at what point um are you starting to you know hear from from your clients is it uh, pre implementation and people are worried and they're trying to get ready for it is it are you hearing from them like the moment like you said they wake up and all of a sudden yep. their the revenue has dropped so I, I what i'm what i'm what i'm keen to discover about that is really the relationship between uh, how much of that revenue is is coming in uh, based off the ads that are currently active versus how much of that revenue is coming in from, as you would also describe, the LTV and how much activity that their website should already have based off the traffic that they've acquired to that point. Okay, so in terms of like uh, preparation, like I don't think anybody expected it to be so severe. But uh, for me, for example, it's like uh, I saw revenue drop. Okay, like this is reality now, right? Like you can't go back to uh, pre-iOS 14 days. So uh, when I basically opted out of tracking just to see it for myself, like see how bad it was, right? I basically 
uh, I'm in a marketing niche. So every single day I like receive guru ads and like courses, stuff like that. And then after I opted out, basically I started receiving furniture ads. So I was, I was thinking to myself, okay, now this is the situation. How do we actually uh, ensure that like uh, we still can target the correct customer, right? So what uh, I found or like uh, after dealing with it and going through the trenches per se is that uh, the first hook is very, very important, right? So the first five seconds, if you are calling out the, the correct target audience, usually Facebook can still find the appropriate customer uh, after that. Yeah, but if you're unable to do so, right, uh, then um, it seems like Facebook, uh, you will not even get a conversion. So absolutely from the get-go, like your, your ad will flop. Okay, so in terms of uh, preparation and dealing with it, it's just more like, okay, if we are extremely dependent on paid advertising, then we diversify away. And then the creatives, right, you just need to be really, really on point in terms of the marketing side, right? You just need to be, uh, call out the correct target audience and show that, okay, this uh, male 20 to 20, uh, 45, uh, loves luxury, you know what I mean? And so that the image or the whatever hook you're using at the start needs to call up that specific uh, characteristic or trait, if that makes sense. And so, and so the follow-up to that too was now more just about the relationship between how much the daily revenue is based off the ads. So let's just say, for instance, a business is running for five years and they've been running ads for uh, for those five years. And, and a lot of traffic has funneled into the, onto their website where they're now part of remarketing. So what I'm, what I, what I'm keen to hear about is why the losses are so heavy when, when the advertising changes. Um, wouldn't there be enough of a, I mean, I guess this is, does depend on how long the business has been around for, but wouldn't there be enough of a, um, of, a, of activity just with their current customer base to, uh, yeah. to keep the losses from being so significant? Yeah. So uh, I won't say surprisingly, but the, the client that was like most affected for me, for example, right, they are back end, they fundamentally didn't take care of the customer. So once the customer came in, then they kind of treated it bad, them badly. And then, you know, they just move on to the next one to acquire the, the new customer. Whereas uh, I have another guy, he's like selling wholesale uh, physical products, stuff like that. So he has a like, reputation in the industry. So his LTV is very high. And even with iOS 14, right, he's actually doing uh, better than ever because he's more willing to spend. And then other people in the space who are not as established, right? Uh, they can't acquire the customer fast, but then they ha- he has the reputation already. So I would say uh, the ones where extremely dependent on pay advertising, then on the back end, you don't actually provide enough value for the customer to come back to you. Uh, you get just absolutely destroyed. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, it's like fundamentals of business, right? If you don't take, a, take care of the customer, the customer won't stay either ways. And I think what this speaks to in, in, in a broader scope is to continue to get the uh, industry away from the gold rush mentality where someone is just trying to set up a website, dropship a product uh, real quick and then not provide any follow-up, not really be a meaningful brand and not being a meaningful contributor to... Uh, to culture and not have any significance in that way. So I see, I see an event like this as a calling of, you know, who means it and who doesn't. Um, and, but I, it's hard for me to comment on how, uh, how that might affect, say, somebody who's you know, dealing in, in, in six figure range, seven figure range. And so I won't. Um, but one way that I think would be a great way to summarize this, and I'd like to get your take on this too, is, so let's say for instance, you know, we have somebody now who's actually, so there's going to be two questions here, but I'll do the first one. So the first one will be for somebody who's, uh, who's, who's entering now, as you say, is less beginner friendly. So what would be some of the key differences between somebody who's starting out, um, post this apocalypse, um, versus pre-apocalypse. Okay. So in terms of like what you actually need to do to survive, if you are starting right now, is that uh, you need to ensure the product quality is like a one from, from, from day one, right? It's, it's okay to drop trip first, but you better get uh, pix- enough pixel data for uh, the purchase to come in so that you know on cold traffic, for example, it converts. Then once you understand, okay, this thing is going to definitely sell, right? Uh, you better make sure the product quality comes in and the customer is very, very happy with that product quality, right? If you are like unable to deliver that promise, right? I don't see your brand like um, living long lah, per se. Yeah. So I would say in terms of, it's not even like a marketing issue. It's more like a fulfillment product quality issue, which a lot of the times is not even your fault because it's the manufacturer. Uh, so I think uh, before selling, you should do more due diligence, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And one thing we're going to do, by the way, to, to my audience is we're going to actually take a look at, uh, at my website just to get a, a, a crash course on that. And that's the position that I'm in right now, too, is, you know, I, I have the product and I'm testing it as if I were a customer and how mm-hmm. this thing actually works. And, and the longer I do that, the more peace of mind that I have. Like okay, well, this thing didn't fall apart after a month. It's been three months; it still hasn't fallen apart. So I, so I take some, some, some comfort in that. And I, and I don't know if everyone is going to have that kind of patience, though. I think a lot of people yep. are still going to just try to see, hey, if this thing works, it's because I didn't get as many complaints as if uh, it, 
if it doesn't work and I get a significant amount of complaints and then I just close up shop and move on. Um, but that's all right. So the other follow-up question that I had, and, and then I move on to, um, uh, to my next points here is in your, uh, in the chronology of your work here, um, have you seen other events, um, that had an impact comparable to the impact of this iOS 14 update? So pre iOS 14, I mean, there was high competition already, but like, uh, in every competitive market, like you're going to have the, the big dogs and the small dogs anyway. So in terms of like marketing wise, not really, because as long as you make better ads and uh, make better offers than other people, you generally can win the market. Um, and then the same a principle goes apl applying for LTV. Like if you can spend more to acquire the customer, uh, then you will win. Uh. So I wouldn't say there's anything specific or anything major, but um, in terms of fulfillment or like the backend stuff, I think the supply chain logistics have matured a lot already. So like more people have access uh, than ever to good fulfillment and logistics. However, uh, product quality is still an issue. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, even from my point of view, there's really only so many ways that we can test product quality, which is yeah. acquire it, use it, see for yourself. And then, and, and it's not even just peace of mind too. It's also being able to write more descriptive copy, I think too, being able to uh, feel it more intuitively, test out more of its features and then understand, I can understand the benefits better because I'm using it. And uh, it's giving me a chance to actually think creatively, which I don't think comes up so much when you're just looking at an image. So the next question that I had, and this, it, it does um, tie a lot into, you know, what we've been talking about so far, but, you know, one of the threads that we, uh, that we established and we talked about in the previous episode is um, drop shipping is a rather pro problematic business model. Um, some of the things I remember, I, I recall you were saying is that if, uh, if Facebook shuts down the, the advertising for it, it's not just mm -hmm. having to, you know, reconfigure the strategy. It's also just the whole thing is now dead in the water. And it's and and now that it's gotten uh, uh, even more difficult. So, um, has your position on on drop shipping uh, changed as a result? Uh, are you are you seeing that it's still probably the best viable way to to get started, or has other ways to get started emerged that might actually compete with drop shipping? Yeah. So I mean, since uh, we talked last time, uh, I learned uh, from clients and also people like I know personally, for example, like they drop ship directly from the US. So you're taking the dropshipping, the best of dropshipping model, and then the 3PL or the manufacturers directly from the US. And then they have just massive white label factories anyway. So you just take, for example, supplements, uh, protein powder, amino acids, stuff like that. You just brand it. And then you're dropshipping directly from the US. So shipping times, you are taking infrastructure of US companies, three to five days, plus product quality is like, uh, not bad, you know? And then you can start from there already, right? So uh, I would say dropshipping is not dead. It's just more like, Dropshipping from China, 10 to 14 days is just increasingly difficult. Uh. So if there are easier ways to do things, why not do easier ways? My suggestion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things is for, for one, even 14 days, I find that surprising. Like some of the stuff that I've ordered off AliExpress took me 30 days. Uh, so if I get it in 14 <laughs> days, I'm like, wow, this is actually pr uh, impressive. Um, I think one of the limiting factors that I would find in dropshipping from US versus dropshipping from China is product variety or product um, uh, selection. Um, it, have you found that for the most part, if I'm looking for something on AliExpress or in other uh, Chinese dropshipping sources, it sh shouldn't be too hard to find something comparable um, in the U.S. Or is the, is, is the U.S. still dealing with more of a limited uh, supplier product? And also, I suppose, are they just are they just basically shipping it from China and then holding it? So then that way, as soon as it's ready to ship, they'll just send it anyways. I would say, yeah, definitely maybe US um, certain products are difficult to find, right? But then if you do it from China as well, uh, the problem most of the time is just cash flow, not enough cash flow to buy inventory for the next one. So then you got a kind of a chicken egg, egg problem, right? So I guess best of both worlds is just um, go to China, like worst case scenario, right? Do your normal dropship stuff. Once you start buying inventory, you buy increasing bulk. So 100, 300, 500. Right. right. Then you can go and take, uh, for example, like clearco.com. Uh, you can go take capitals and loans and stuff and you show the Shopify dashboard and say, uh, look at my cash flow increasing. It's fine. Sales and everything. Uh, ROAS is fine. Right. Then you just get a loan from there and stuff. But then again, it's like most dropshippers don't think about that because there's real risk involved. Sorry about this. Yeah. And then, is it time um, but that, that, uh, no, <laughs> it's just a bit QC, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But basically that is kind of uh, the model that you kind of have to go to if you want to seriously succeed in this game. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, one of the big things that I wanted to, uh, that we wanted to talk about 
um, was uh, you know importance of messaging and the offer and, uh, and and more important than ads. And even just hearing that, I I basically agree. Um, but what I really want to expand on here is the like the significance of it um, and is the or how i would see like the ad is supposed to be the carrier for the message and the offer so it's not like an ad appears that doesn't have the message and the offer um so that's those are some of the my my initial thoughts on this but uh, this is uh, something that i uh, like to hear you expand on so uh the ad if you think about it right people don't pay uh, people don't pull out the credit card on the ad right people pull out the credit card on the product page so the ad like you said is the carrier is just to sell the click once they're curious enough about the product mm-hmm. then you sell the offer on the product page so if you think about it, okay, I am selling, uh, look at this water bottle, right? Everybody in the world, there are like 70 competitors with this thing. So why yeah. am, why is someone going to buy this versus someone uh, like someone like me, right? So uh, does it have a specific unique selling point about the physical product? Uh, does it convey different benefits? Is it like, uh, does it water filter the thing so that it's cleaner water? Stuff like that. So that's specific to the product itself, right? Then you can do other value added things such as, uh, can you create an ebook that is specifically talking about, I don't know, water consumption, um, benefits of drinking water, stuff like that. Or you even throw in something inexpensive, right? Something like a water filter, additional cap, something together with that physical product. And even though from a Cox perspective, uh, that seems like it's going to be more burden on you, right? But to the customer, it's like, I would definitely buy you versus someone else, right? And if you pit it side by side, which actually, uh, if you do Google ads, Google shopping and stuff, you are literally side by side with your customer. So you should think about these things because uh, as your products get more commoditized, people can come into the space, immediately just run traffic against you. Um, there's only so much you can differentiate. And so uh, I really think offer and like the most creative marketers will win per se because they just understand the game. The, 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 like, the noobs, right, will just get crushed basically. Yeah. Well, you said sell the click. And that's the first yeah. time that I've heard somebody say that. And you'll have to forgive me if you said that last time. I've, yeah, I i can't keep track of every, every uh, thing like that. Uh, but I think that is, uh, it, it, it's significant. And what I like about it is it, it conditions, I guess, the the advertiser to um, figure out the value of the clicks and where the clicks are coming from. So yeah. depending on where I'm advertising, if I'm advertising on Facebook, if I'm advertising on Google, advertising on Bing, each one of those clicks will mm-hmm. um, yield a, any, any amount of results. Maybe people from one source will come onto the website, but they just won't commit. Whereas they come from another source, same ad. But they yep. they come to the website and they don't uh, they don't commit. So um, y- when you when you're uh, using this, whether it's working on on your own stuff, I, uh, which actually I don't know if you're doing at the moment, or if you're working with your with your clients, is how do you uh, deploy this um, uh, this mentality, or how are you helping the 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 the, the business or the brand understand yep. where are the clicks are valuable, where are the clicks coming from? So to tap on your point about selling the click and stuff. So you must think about selling the click as uh, the ad is trying to prime you psychology, uh, so psychological wise, like a bias for you to go into the landing page. So imagine if I say, uh, Joseph is an e-commerce dropshipping expert on the end, mm-hmm. right? When I'm going to the page, right, I'm expecting uh, a consistency of information. So you can prime someone psychologically, like uh, to say on the ad first, and then you deliver that promise on the landing page. Uh, so that's basically the, the first thing in terms of like how to sell the click. Uh. Uh, the second question you said was, um, how are you seeing what valuable clicks there are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of uh, generally, we write uh, long form copy. So when you write long form copy on the ad, right? There is um, there's more uh, commitment to the click. Okay, even though the click may be a bit more expensive than fifty percent off and stuff like that, right? But the quality of the click on on that, we know for a fact, it's like because they are primed already on the ad, they have that psychological bias. Once they come onto the landing page, they usually convert because of the long form copy. So. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. So that's why storytelling is very, very important and powerful per se, because um, if you pit you versus your competitor, you're telling a story, someone else is selling based on discount, you're going to beat them every single time because you can't quantify story. makes sense. You can't put a premium on story. And so when people see a story based ad, uh, it's uh, when I go to the landing page, right? I'm not buying based on price anymore. I'm buying based on emotion. Makes sense? <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it, it does. And, and it opens up a through line that I... Um, and not only have I uh, been been aware of uh, uh, doing this position, but also um, in in other you know jobs that I've held too, is you know story selling is one of the strongest things. And it's kind of it's kind of funny, kind of eerie in how for for all the for all the data in the world, there is that top five percent in the person's uh, mind that is an emotional thing, it's a psychological or even a spiritual thing that 
um, has that final result. And that's the kind of thing that is exceedingly difficult to, to quantify. What is it about a story that resonates with somebody and how does it uh, connect on that emotional level? It, it's, it seems to me that it's always going to be somewhat nebulous and that there, it's it's just not easy to, and even if you do collect data on it, it's not going to even reflect the, 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 the entirety of what happened. At least that's what I think. Uh, and in, in your position, um, did I just pull it out of thin air? Or how, like, have you ever been able to assess anything based off the emotional results, based off the spiritual results? Or is that the kind of thing that even at your 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 level is left to the imagination? Yeah, so you can't really quantify that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't can't, think I can't so, really but it's worth that. a shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the most uh, powerful thing is like uh, after they buy, like, like the click comes in, the purchase comes in, everything. And then uh, the customer actually, we talk to them on Zoom call, right? So for example, I, I force my client to like, okay, go and find your highest LTV customers, right? You go and interview them, send them email, say, hey, uh, can I have 15 minutes of your time? I want to understand why you're buying uh, my stuff, right? And then when she came on, she was very, very happy. She showed the bag, everything. And it's like, okay, this makes me feel really good because there's, there's image representation, something like that. So it's like, um, in terms of understanding your customer persona is a bit more difficult because uh, data, like digital marketers, you know, they just like sit at their computer and stuff. But once you start talking to the customer, you get a very, very strong sensing of who you're selling to. And uh, that actually helps and improves conversion at the same time. Purely because you know you know who exactly and what the pain point is and stuff like that and what resonates with your highest bias, right? So if you are running e-com now, you probably should definitely do this, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But uh, go to the top 10 LTV people and then just go and interview them. Right? So you don't have to do so many, but you should go to the people who have continuously bought from you over and over again because they've indicated with their money that they trust you the most. Yeah, That's actually the first time that I've uh, heard somebody suggest doing that. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, okay. I think it's a great idea. And, um, and it reminds me of you know, one of the threads that we had talked about previously is you know, if a person has that kind of confidence uh, to be the face of the brand, then they should do it and not rely on somebody else to, to, to be the influencer on their behalf if, they, if they're so inclined. Not everybody has that. Uh, has that skill. So, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't make a square, try to act like a circle. We understand. Uh, but I think it's a great idea. And what I, what I think this ties into is part of the user generated content uh, overall strategy. So uh, it, in, in a way, I think that, you know, interviewing the, the client counts as content, even if it's not displayed publicly. Yep. Because now the, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting this I'm um, getting, it's like a private review, feedback. I, I assume that if they have anything negative to say, that's a good chance to, to do it too, say it directly to the CEO. So is this, are our interviews, are they always remain, do they always stay private or is it, do they ever turn into either like a case study or testimonial yep. or in some way that it can actually be uh, displayed publicly? Sure. I mean, if, uh, if your client is comfortable, then obviously more than happy to right, do it. But obviously you uh, do it for internal documentation first. Right after you interview, get permission from the, from the customer. Say, okay, can we put this on landing page? I think it'll make a really good review and stuff like that. Right, you actually can. Uh, I recommend uh, some people I coach to do this as well. So it's like you set up an entirely different landing page. You put it at the top bar, and then you just put reviews, and then you just stack like fifty reviews all in one page. You would significantly see your conversion rate increase overnight. So like it's it's hard work obviously to get those testimonials, but it's definitely worth it. And it's also assets that you can run as paid advertising on the front end. So yeah, I agree. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, one more follow up to this is um, someone on a, on a granular level. What kind of questions do you recommend uh, that people would generally ask to, sure. to get the best answers? So it's uh, like, okay, why did you buy from us? Uh, what made you buy from us? Um, what was the like number one thing that if we do, you will be very happy? And then uh, mm. stuff like, uh, what else would you like to see from us? Yeah. So it's like, okay, you are trying to identify the positive attributes that your brand is uh, portraying to the customer and then uh, find what those are that identify, then obviously ask for improvement in the, in the last one. So what, well, how can you improve? How can we help you? How we can make your experience better, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So like uh, all this information, right? You probably put in like a Google form and then you ask them, uh, you know, they compile, see uh, with, with your company or staff or whatever, and then examine, and then you know what to do next in terms of what product to build next, what to sell next also. Yeah. I, okay. Sorry. I, I said I had one more. Uh, that was my last follow up. But uh, yeah. I come from film, so we're used to people saying <laughs> one more time, one more time, one more time. Um, I, I also happen to think that this is um, one of the keenest ways to uh, build out the customer avatar. So if I have, uh, you know, let's just say I do ten interviews and I'm and I met ten of my ten uh, uh, best LTVs uh, customers, I 
I think what I would want to do is try to create somewhat of an aggregate or somewhat of an average based off their their answers and their spending habits. Maybe yeah. they all seem to be wearing the same kind of clothing for some reason. Um, it, so it, how accurate would you say you're able to come up with an avatar based off uh, based off this information? Uh, based on like top spenders, it should be you should be able to stereotype quite easily. Okay, great. So uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, I appreciate this, but I also realize that I, uh, I'm, I'm going to get schlacked here just because there's a few things that are wrong with my website, but that's okay. It's probably better that I get schlacked than yeah, yeah. Uh, everything okay. be perfect. Um, so uh, uh, Jonathan has offered to have a look at my website and okay. I, I'm going to uh, pull up screen share. And um, yeah, we'll just we'll we'll just run through this. So again, to my uh, uh, loyal audio audience, uh, this would be one of those times where you may want to hop on over to our video, which is on the Debutify YouTube channel. Uh, I know how this feels. I've been an audio listener for podcasting for ten years. It happens. All right. I guess I'll just give you the the grand tour first, so that you sure. can start collecting your thoughts. Um, so it's called Second Second Space. Uh, I okay. was hoping to be able to just do secondspace.com, but that domain was thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So I had to mm -hmm. go with Second Space Shop. That's okay. So the brand is based on, uh, it goes into um, home living and home working niche. So I, essentially, the more somebody spends in their apartment or their house, the more they're my target market. Um, so right now, it's mostly about the you know the remote working position. And the idea was to look for products, but also the psychology behind giving people more freedom in their own homes. So mm -hmm. products that allow your wall to be able to store more. Um, the, the signature product that I'm working on right now is called the widget drawer, although usually it's referred to as the self stick drawer. So yeah, so self stick widget drawer. Uh, and then mm -hmm. a couple of variations of it, um, basic ones, ones with the lock on it in case you want to put your keys or your glasses in there. And then yeah. these ones over here, which are pretty hefty. Uh, the the pricing is, um, th this one is $51. The only reason why is because my 3PL charges quite a bit to ship this. So I don't actually make a heck of a lot of money out of it. This is one of the ones where I just kind of want people to have it. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, uh, that's the image for it. Um, still working on better copy for it. Obviously, this is not story yeah, selling, yeah. <laughs> but that's a that's fine. And then the other side to it uh, would also be the blog. So uh, I don't have anything written on that yet. So there's obviously a lot of work to do. But what I and this this will tie into a, a question that I that I wanted to ask you as well, which is um, if it's possible. Not that I care. In fact, I would prefer this. I would prefer to be wrong on this, but if you've seen people be able to really run a website, sell products and succeed without any additional content or value uh, on the back end, um, like no newsletter, no blog, yeah. Yeah. Um, very, very bare bones. I, I'm getting the impression that you see those once in a while, but they don't really do much. So uh, that's everything I have to show. And I will uh, now take my, my lumps like a big boy. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is your real store, right? Okay. Uh, when you say newsletter and blog, you mean blog, not email marketing, right? So the blog would be he uh, here. But that's one thing that we can touch on more specifically. Um, there's a blog, but the blog is not necessarily what I would send in the email. The email, um, okay. maybe say a uh, snippets of the blog, um, but the plan so, in so far right now is I would not email the blog to people. Okay. Can. So if, if you don't do blogs, honestly, yeah, you still can kill it. Don't worry. You can make a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I wanted would, to do a yeah. blog anyways, but uh, I just wanted to ask mm -hmm. just for, uh, just out of curiosity. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, in the future, if you need SEO, then the blog is useful. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can make tons of money without a blog. Um, that's the one. Uh, okay. So question for you first, right? It's like, okay, who exactly are you selling to? Like who is your target customer here? Sure. So um, the clearest avatar that I have would be remote workers, uh, people who are, you know, living and sleeping basically in the same room. Um, uh, the more uh, hermits, the more people uh, live at home, uh, work at home, uh, the more likely that I uh, want to convert them. Um, so yeah, that's my clearest avatar right now is the remote worker. Okay, so anybody 23 and up, I would say? Is yeah, right? I'd say like 23 to 40, I think past that point. I'm not sure if they're, you don't get as okay. many people who I think have glommed on to remote working. Um, and, 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 and as well, I think 
when because they have had the habit of working in an office for far longer my mm-hmm. um my assumption is that as they can start going back to the office they will and so you go to your product page scroll down uh go to your have you run any traffic so far uh no not yet okay okay so you go to the most promising product that you have first okay i'll start with the basic one then okay okay so n- number one problem with this right is that uh, i do not know who this is for Okay, so in terms of, uh, like you said, for example, you need to be like super, super specific. So for example, if you sell um, kitchenware, right, you need to identify, okay, uh, house mothers, housewives, uh, 30 plus, have kids in kindergarten, stuff like that. You need to be like really drilled down onto that perspective. Uh, otherwise, it's very, it's going to be very expensive to acquire the customer. And then you're going to be bleeding money on ads. Okay, that's, that's number one. So you want to try to identify different personas first, like so specific until until then. Uh, so for example, that could be one persona. The second one could be like, um, uh, women who are uh, like career women, right? They don't have a lot of time, but then they are still in their early twenties, for example, right? So you, they can you can sell kitchen stuff to to those sort of people, and the messaging for moms versus them is different. So that's the first thing you need to really identify. Uh, then the second thing is also uh, here, right? For example, your entire product page, right? You need to have more lifestyle shots. So I understand the the underneath trade thing, but you need to have like a video showing exactly like how do you actually pull this out, how do you actually install this stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. If I am going to pay 13 bucks uh, to an internet site, uh, to a store I, I've never shopped before, I need to understand how this works and how it actually looks like when I unbox it. That's the second thing. Uh, number three, right? if you're actually looking to run ads towards this offer, for example, uh, I think your price point really cannot make it. Okay, A lot of the times I recommend anywhere AOV is more than 60. The reason why is because um, if you're going to spend for ads, right, you're going to be paying anywhere from like 50 cents to maybe like $2 right? in this town niche, I would say. So in terms of like conversion rate wise, if you think about math, Right. If you have uh, 50 cents, you spend 100 bucks. Right. How many uh, people are there? There's 200. Right. I'm guessing. Yeah. If your conversion rate is, let's say, three to five percent, right. After ad costs and stuff, your profit is going to be very, very little. For, uh, so you're unable to reinvest into your ads per se. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's kind of the first thing, uh. And then the second thing I think about is like if you are using this as your front end offer, right. For example, if this is your quantity number one, are people actually going to buy two, three, four of this? Which means that that 13 dollar price point. Uh, if you times four, it becomes like $60, right? So that, that totally makes sense if people are buying four of it. But I don't see uh, people having four tables, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I don't think people are going to buy this. Okay, that's the second thing. Uh, you, do you want me to continue? Sorry, <laughs> I know I'm talking a lot. Well, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. well I mean, I, I have a number of follow-ups, so I'm just kind of jotting notes down and then we'll go through my follow-ups, sure. but I didn't want to interrupt your stream of consciousness. Okay, yeah. So you scroll down a bit. Okay, stop. So you can see share and get 10%, right? So the, the problem with like um, product pages on Shopify, for example, is that they try to get the customer to do uh, too much, right? So you want, the only action that you want the customer to do is to give you money. So if you're asking yeah. them to do a different action, you're, you're basically distracting them and you're paying for that $1 click already. So uh, you right. better not do this, right? So you better remove this stuff. All this stuff here is completely irrelevant. Right? People don't care about this. So you just remove all this stuff, right? Uh, then you scroll down. Yeah. So this is, uh, people don't understand, right? If you look at the heat maps, I look at a lot of heat maps in my lifetime. So mm-hmm. I know for a fact, um, people don't barely scroll down below the add to cart button. So if you think about it, this is prime real estate space that you're paying for already. So you need to really try to engage the customer either by a video, uh, uh, a photo plus like benefit driven headline, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Or you are doing like influencer content, like reviews, right? So like this is missing and this is basically prime real estate. So you shouldn't be um, wasting it here. Okay, this is also if you actually look in for example, if you right-click inspect, right, you go into the mobile view, for example, it's very, very difficult to read this information. And the reason why is because when you clump uh, paragraphs together, there's too much going on. So what you actually want to do instead is try to do more bullet points per se when you're talking mm-hmm. about benefits. So it's easier for the person to see. Uh, yeah, okay, you need to go here. This button. I didn't, I didn't yep. even know this was a feature. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you, you, you can see this, right? Like if I'm scrolling, if I am, sorry, uh, looking at hot girls or like cars and stuff on Instagram, and then I come to this and then like, hey, this guy is expecting me to read this. I'm like, yo, Joseph, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, yeah, this primary estate, you definitely want to put in a uh, more media, photo, video sort of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, then at the bottom, okay, this one, every time you upsell something, right, you need to be very, very careful. The reason yeah. why is because if you are trying to upsell, okay, so this is your basically your front end offer, what you're selling on the ad, right? So the person is expecting this product already. If you are trying to introduce a different uh, offer, right? I need to understand exactly how this ties into my initial 
uh, purchase to buy. So for example, the first, the first one is like pulling out from the drawer, but from this product itself, this image, I do not understand how this will help me with the same problem here. Mm. Okay, so your, your complementary offers, right? Your upsells, uh, sorry, your cross-sells need to really, really complement each other in solving the same problem or uh, being in the same realm per se, right? I have no idea what this means. This looks like Lego to me. Yeah. So yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the, uh, the, the diagram image. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then down below, um, okay, so the next one, I wouldn't recommend you to put recommended for you so fast, right? Mm -hmm. I'd rather you put more uh, social proof and testimonials. So to actually show that actually people are using this stuff, uh, Lacey from California, uh, Joseph from Canada is using this stuff. So I'm from Canada, Canada, California, for example, right? I'm probably going to trust them. So you probably want to move your customer reviews up as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in regards to getting reviews is, um, right now, the only way to really do that is from, from the resources that I have is importing them from uh, AliExpress or using, uh, using judge.me. Uh, I think that's, I mean, have you, I almost hate to ask this, but have you <laughs> had to recommend people to say like get their family and friends to, or, or even like, have there been other routes to, to get some of those early reviews that you can think of? Uh, the fastest way is really sending product to influencers, for example. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You can okay. do the paid or free way. I mean, it really doesn't matter, but uh, more like as long as people really get their hands in the product and like there's a genuine connection to the brand, I think that's more important than anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that's all, uh, uh, that's all fantastic. Yeah. There's definitely a, a lot, but it's, you know what, if anything, it's better to, uh, for, for this thing to be in, in, in poor shape just so that we can get more, uh, more from you. So, uh, I'm not uh, in any way, shape or form, um, diminished in ego. In fact, I actually feel better about this. Um, but I do have some questions. <laughs> yeah. So sure. one of the things is, so you asked me about, you know, the, uh, uh, what, what customer am I going for? And, and I ask, and I say the remote worker as my answer, but the issue is it, it's like, I almost, I'm more, it's like, I'm, I'm just trying to pass the test rather than really try to answer the question in the most uh, earnest way possible because mm -hmm. i don't necessarily want to limit the remote worker i just think the remote worker would probably be one of the best beneficiaries but when you talked about how say some uh you know working mother uh these can be useful in the kitchen yep. the, you know they are useful in the kitchen so what i i don't if i were to say replace the image right now of the two uh, buildings when trying to convey like the office space um if i replace that with an image of somebody working from home as a remote worker my concern yep. is that would then limit the results from any other potential customer. But at the same time, having this is rather vague. So yep. I don't think it, it, it attracts anybody. So I guess my thought process thinking out loud here is it's better to focus on targeting at least one person and get one avatar very clearly and then, yep. um, and, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So I, I actually can like justify it logically, uh, Sure. and explain to you why that is the case. So you scroll down a bit. Uh, you go to some white, white space so I can draw. Uh, yeah, yeah, here's fine. Yeah. yeah, so if, like why I recommend you to do like very, very specific persona in the first place is because usually beginners don't have ads to spend, right? And if you're in a cashman situation, you are very, very stressed. You cannot, you literally cannot think, right? So what happens is in the market, for example, everybody's going after the same customer. So I'd rather you try to dominate one part of the market, right? You get profitable, you get the first sales first. Once you understand that's proof of concept and on cold traffic, you actually can convert customers at a very, very small target customer, right? Because the big boys are not trying to like stack up against you. Only once you try to dominate this market, right? You try to squeeze all LTV from here. Then if you want to go into a more broader remote worker area, so let me put remote worker, then it totally makes sense for you, right? If you go into remote worker first, you are going to have to spend X amount just to acquire that one customer. Then you might be thinking and discouraged by dropshipping is very, very difficult. If you start off with very, very small targeted nobody else is attacking the same market as you. So it gives you competitive edge, not only in terms of like ad targeting and copy conversion per se, right? But everybody in that small little circle is going to go to your brand. Make okay. Sense? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it does, except I, if you had asked me who would be in that circle, I would have thought the, the remote worker would have fit in the small circle. Um, not Maybe perhaps for me, not understanding the scope of how many people were working remotely. There's quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so what... If, if you know, what would be the even smaller market that would fit in that circle? Sure. So a uh, remote worker, right? Uh, there are different jobs, right? So you could okay. be uh, like a digital marketer, e-com people, right? Then there are lawyers and accountants who mm -hmm. definitely are remote working, right? Then there are programmers as well. 
So each one of these niches, right, they all have specific different pain points, right? Programmers, they type a lot. They use a lot of their keyboard um, and they just stare at black screens all day, right? Then lawyers, accountants, they're looking at a lot of paperwork. They're scanning their command effing a lot because they're searching for stuff. So the pain point is super, super specific. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow, I, I just I I don't want to uh, spend too, too long just uh, <laughs> staring in awe, but this has actually put a lot of, uh, of uh, clues together. So, um, with this answer, I guess one thing that I'm that I'm thinking of it would also be in the realm of artists. So, yes. uh, artists, uh, illustrators, people who have you know the pencils and and, and erasers and and pens and and markers on hand, so they have a lot of tools that they would uh, play around with. So, um, just to summarize this. Uh, it would be more ideal to pick one of these and, and be, even like reshape the website um, so much so that it's like a haven for the lawyers in specific or a haven specifically for the, uh, the, the digital marketers. Yes, that's correct. So I'll give you an example, okay, because I was running traffic uh, from one of my friends. Uh, he's selling a, a mouse, okay? It's a job, it's a job shipping product, like straight up. And then uh, the, his, the competitors, right, are all selling the angle of comfort only. So you put your hand on the mouse and it basically like removes carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, mm -hmm. right? He's attacking this market and he is skilled to, uh, I saw, we saw the video ads, like what, 7 million views already. So I'm no way going to even come close to beating this guy if I'm going to attack the same angle. So what we did was we go to Amazon and we go and find the reviews and then we go and find the exact pain points of specific customers. And from our research, right, we found that a lot of people using graphic design, Illustrator, Photoshop type of people all are experiencing this problem. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, this works for me. I'm a graphic designer, blah, blah, one, two, three, four. Right? So we went to attack this market and from the get-go, we are really profitable. That's incredible. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think I, for me, at, the, at, this, at this point, I'm just uh, in absorption phase. phase. So with, um, with that, so my only other question is, so there are, there is more of a, uh, of a, of a big idea to, to the brand, uh, like with what I was describing with, you know, wanting to encourage people to be more creative with their space, find other ways to use it. So um, my other concern, and this is, I guess, the last one that I really have is, actually, no, there was another one I'll follow up on. So is, um, I'm not sure exactly how to ask it, but am I going to have to, I guess, um, restrain the scope of the brand um, at, until it expands into uh, uh, more markets? Um, before, before I guess I write about things I want to write about. So for, for instance, if I'm targeting specifically, I'm going to go with, I'm going to say illustrators, uh, just because, you know, I'm, I have more experience in the arts niche. So mm -hmm. if I'm targeting them, then when they go visit the blog, the content that they're going to read there should probably be very specific to illustrators. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, yeah, so uh, the... Uh, the other thing that I wanted to to go back to, so we when you said the average the AOV would be uh, sixty dollars on this, and these are thirteen seventy seven. So this is just really a basic question for you, which is uh, how much would you be charging this? You said just to be clear, you said it would be sixty dollars. No, okay. So I I recommend everybody if you're selling anything, your AOV like no matter what you do, right? If you want to run ads per se, be a sixty. So this product, of course, you cannot charge sixty for it because you, <laughs> you cannot justify it unless it's like gold. So I don't recommend this to be a front end product. So I do not recommend you to run ads to this product specifically. If you okay. want this to be a cross sell or a back end offer, totally fine, fair enough. But don't go and run ads to this. You could just get absolutely destroyed in the auctions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, noted. Uh, and then I think that's actually uh, everything that I had to uh, say about this. So I'm gonna uh, turn off the, the screen share. So yeah, awesome. Definitely a, a, lot, a lot for me to learn there too. And I know, and I know our audience, um, a lot of them are also kind of like putting these pieces together themselves and and trying to uh, trying to come to terms with uh, with a lot of it. So the 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 last thing would be is the roadmap for uh, how are you if somebody chooses to expand their brand, kind of like where I'm going with it is, but they're focusing very specifically on this uh, on this one niche is. Mm -hmm what's the roadmap for branching the brand outwards? Um, and I mean that in, you know, the products that they're selling with the, the brand itself that they, and the ideas that they want to convey is how does somebody get to their uh, vision of the, of the end game and how they, how they see it. Can I assume they already have one product? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They would have to have at least one product. Okay. Yeah. Can. So, uh, 
because I, I put it in the story of uh, for example a client that I work with right so the guy he went Kickstarter for example and then he sell uh, sold compression gear so he actually pre-sold the thing on Kickstarter so we know it works right and then mm-hmm. he was dropshipping he's basically dropshipping from China but sending to the US for example then afterwards he transitioned to Shopify and then started selling there and compression gear so then after uh, looking uh, like selling like spending around 100k in ads afterwards right there's a massive database called analysis wise right most of them generally are male uh, for example, volleyball, running, uh, football, stuff like that, right? So we know that audience is there. So how do we sell to this customer base and expand LTV from there? So think about, okay, so if this customer cares about uh, post-recovery uh, compression, what else does he care about? He probably cares about post-workout, post-workout recovery, feeling good about his body, right? So the potential things that we could sell to, for example, is like uh, medicinal oil. Um, we talk about um, compression gear, but for other parts of the body, right? They already literally have given us money for one part of the body. Why won't they mm-hmm. give us for other parts, right? Then we can think about, uh, for example, like post-recovery amino acid stuff like that. Uh, like post-work, you know, those kind of shakes, stuff like that, right? So you can think about it. One product, you already have a customer base. The customer base is in sports. You can literally sell them anything as long as it makes sense, right? So the, the first intention of the product, the core product is recovery. So you want to re- have a recurring theme of recovery in the rest of the products as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so how do you like uh, de-risk yourself to per se? Because you're buying stock, you're buying inventory, right? So that's real risk there. How do you de-risk yourself so that if you launch a product, it's definitely going to sell, right? You literally just go and ask your customer on a Zoom call, on an email list and say, hey, what would you like to buy from us? That's why the interviews are very, very important. Because right? of the customer discovery phase, uh, once they say, okay, we will literally buy this thing if you produce this thing. Okay, then you put up a pre-order page. You put up a run traffic, send an email list there. If people legit buy from you, even without you manufacturing the product, you know you got something already. So that's how you generally like um, build from scratch. You build from one core product, even though it's drop shipping first, you got the customer list. You know for a fact they, they are going to love this thing, right? But then after you branch out, you just ask them once again, what you want more? And then we just sell you more stuff. Um, well, when you were going on to uh, Amazon, this is uh, following up on uh, uh, more of on a previous thread. But so you're on Amazon and you're looking more for, um, for, for, for the different pain points. So let's just say, for instance, I, I didn't have any products on there, um, but at least I knew that I was um, in the, you know, the, the, the remote working niche and then I'm niching down from there. So how does somebody exactly um, find the pain point and then how, how would you know what's the right product to get to solve that pain point? Because um, you can find, I think you can find products that might generally work, but they might not be so precise. So yep. hey, can you can you take us through that thought process? Uh, so you're thinking about how can we produce a new product that hasn't been created, is it? Well, even I, I not not even I mean that would be great, but not even that. It would be how do I know what product to find to solve the pain point that I've been finding in my research? Okay, so generally uh, a lot of products have been created, so you don't have to risk yourself too much in creating something new from scratch. Yep. But you go to customer uh, reviews on Amazon of a specific niche or specific product you're looking at you go and look at the one-star reviews. So what has this, what are the promises that this product has given but has not delivered on? And then, okay, the new product is going to be significantly better in these specific pain points so that uh, his strengths compared to this guy's weakness, right? This guy does stuff XXX very, very well well already. We are going to do that. We're just going to make it even better and superior. I see. I mean, it would t- I guess it'd take a little bit of sifting through because you have like one-star reviews where somebody just said, oh, it didn't show up or a customer flipped me off. So like there's... You had to get through those, but I think that's uh, a keen way to, I, I can't believe I never thought of this. I've been doing this for a year. I never thought about <laughs> that. Just like looking, for, like going through the negative reviews and be like, why are pe- people who've paid money? Why are they still yeah, happy? Yeah. 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 Um, and, and it might be, by the way, and this is me just speculating, but it might be that, you know, the product itself is great. It's just that the company stinks. If they treat the customers poorly, if the, yeah. if they, if the customer service doesn't uh, come through, if shipping times are... Uh, unconscionable, then it might be that, you know what, maybe it is just a product that's fine after all. And I just need to run a better company and have a better brand. I guess I'll tell you another uh, tidbit uh, in addition to that, right? It's like, okay, you go to Amazon to get the bad reviews. You go to the brand website to get the good reviews. They are only going to talk good about themselves, right? So right. you go and find the strengths from their site. And then you just take the, the, in a sense, the copy from the customer testimonial. And then you go and run that as your paid advertising if you are going to attack the angle as well. I see. Yeah, yeah, that, ma- that, that makes sense. Okay, well, that, that's, been a, that's been a great crash course. Um, and we still got you for a little bit of time. I know it's, it's, it's late for you there, so uh, I'm not going to uh, keep you for the uh, six hours that I had planned. But I, 
Um, there's a couple of things I just wanted to ask in winding down, just some more um, granular uh, pieces of info. So sure. one of them is, this is another term, um, as if you hadn't introduced in enough good concepts, new concepts for us today. Um, but you mentioned this uh, way early on, which is uh, COGS, which is cost of yeah. goods sold. So uh -huh. we haven't covered that, at least to my recollection. Um, so would you uh, do us the uh, distinct honor of informing us how COGS is a part sure. of our business plan and our strategy? Sure. So if you are selling physical product, COGS is the is the killer, basically. So COGS is cost of goods sold. It's basically an accounting term for your financial statements. And it's measuring uh, how much does it raw material cost to actually uh, manufacture the product. So this is excluding shipping generally. So that's why uh, on the income statement, you see COGS plus shipping, right? And so uh, COGS is very, very important because if you are in a paid advertising environment where you are competing against other people, everybody has a margin, right? And so if you heard this term before, Bezos says, um, your margin is my opportunity. So if you are willing to go and slice your margin very, very low, um, it's fine, right? However, a real company, you need to operate on cash flow. So you need a margin because you need to pay employees, customer support, software, transaction marketing and stuff like that. So if you don't have a margin to play with, you are screwed because, because after the sale, you don't have any enough money. So what I recommend to people, right, is like even at any point in business in e-com, I know it's very, very difficult, especially in dropshipping, but once you go and brand the e-com, inventory, stuff like that, you need to try to reduce your cocks to anywhere from 35% and below. If you can take it under 30%, right, it's very, very good. So your pricing in terms of your product is $100. You try to get it at $33 and below. Okay, and the reason why is because that 67, right, uh, your cost per purchase, is um, it fluctuates, right? So you need margin to play with, per se. Well, and I, th and I think businesses, they're, they're facing a lot of challenges there. I mean, one of them, one solution I speculate would be if you just increase the price of the product, then you're, you're covering, uh, you're, you're covering your, your cogs more easily, but then yep. you're now making it more tense for the customer to convert. So that's yes. one solution, but it also has its own problem. The other side of it is, is if there's anything in, in the business that um, can't be sacrificed, or say if like, if it comes down to something as specific as reducing customer service hours from 15 a week to 12.5 a week. So in, in your experience of when people have to uh, figure out how to minimize their, 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 their cost of goods sold is yep. how, how, how do they do it? How does it work? And then, I mean, because I'm, I'm imagining that people have tried to reduce the cost and then end up yep. Um, actually um, causing them more money in, in the long run because there was a significant component that they thought was ineffective yes. and it turns out to actually be very useful. Yeah. So uh, you might always think, okay, let's go to China and let's communicate and negotiate with these guys and then just bring it down. So it doesn't work like that, right? Life's not like that. So yeah. how, how can you factor that and like uh, take control of your business basically? Okay, the only way is to increase AOV and lifetime value. So instead of trying to reduce cost, like reduce cost per purchase, right? You try to increase AOV. So how can we sell three of more things uh, to the same person? Or you can even go the wholesale route, right? Instead of someone buying three at a time, you buy 500 at one time, right? It completely changes your economics of the business because like how many customers do you actually really need, right? And then, you know, you can think uh, much bigger as well, right? So a lot of the times the company, uh, you see a lot of dropshippers, right? They can get to seven figures. Very few of them get to eight figures. The reason why is because they spend a lot on ads, then the profit is so little, they cannot buy inventory to basically uh, reflect that and, you know, roll over to the next cycle as well. So a lot of the times, the, the biggest companies are the ones who just understand LTV and then they can able to extend it. So uh, physical product wise, uh, I'm a very big supporter generally of like subscription, recurring uh, consumables, stuff like that. I know food is very, very difficult to, to make per se, right? But those are businesses like uh, they'll win the e-com game, hands down, I feel. Yeah. One of the things that um, I've talked about with other um, uh, with other guests throughout the show and also you know inter internally with the company as well is there's just certain products that seem to be no-go areas for, for, for beginners is um, I think like skin cream, consumables, supplements, uh, products like that, at least in my experience, um, they've been rather difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to start with. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, is, is that accurate or has there, have you seen a decent roadmap for somebody interested in say the supplement market to, at a, at a beginner level? So if it's a beginner level, there are actually us, I, I know like the U S manufacturers that actually do drop shipping. So they do actually allow you to drop ship supplements, believe it or not. And you don't have to worry because they take care of FDA. Uh, I don't know what the other certifications are, but they take care of everything. You literally just handle marketing. So if you are like super noob, like, like pure beginner, like from get-go, like you might want to try organic marketing first, right? Really try to acquire customers organically. Once you can hit like 5K per month consistently through like, you know, just content per se, posting, 
you should be good to go to use to go into paid advertising. And then there you are. Um, like, I don't know about you, but like, I think a lot of people think like the ad game is everything. Like paid traffic is great, but if you don't have organic traffic first, you are, it's just very difficult per se. I, yeah, I mean, I come from the, uh, from the Ricky Hayes school of marketing is king. So while advertising is a key component of that, as you say, organic marketing is also uh, an important uh, component to that as well. So it's not just about running paid ads. It's about um, uh, finding all the different uh, methods to, to reach people and in different ways too. Some I think are more cold where some can, uh, can come across much more warmly, you know, even doing a podcast interview, talking about your supplements yeah, yeah, or yeah. your, your exactly. story and why they're useful. That alone can, uh, can probably get more, I think, more invested conversions than the running ads. So it's all part of a bigger picture. Correct. Right, like so Facebook ads, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. What you have Facebook to say is probably more valuable. Like, <laughs> Facebook ads is just like one channel. So like you just think of it as one channel and then you just have 50 channels, that's all. Yeah. All right, so on the other uh, granular question that I, ha I had for you, uh, just a chance to um, give some other pieces of software some exposure. Um, so there's, I, I went through your, your um, uh, the software kit and look for all the ones that I didn't recognize. And there was, uh, there was a couple. Um, Connect.io, PushOwl, uh, HiRows, ActiveCampaign, and ReConvert. So rather than make you go through each one of these and, and be the ambassador for all of them, um, yeah. I, I, would, I think it would be a more fair word to ask is the, the overall uh, picture of this, um, this. This is a complete kit that somebody can, can use and it covers all of the bases for, for their business. So um, can you just talk about the network or the... Um, uh, the ecosystem here of how these products are all working together. You said reconvert, right? Is it? I, I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Reconvert. I actually met the founder as well in Israel. Uh, Aria. Oh, okay, right so uh, uh, reconvert does post purchase upsell. So they just uh, increase AOV by um, after you buy one thing, you can recommend the next thing to buy. And then I think they're building basically like click funnels within reconvert as well. So you can like post purchase one, two, three, four, stuff like that. So very, very powerful stuff. Uh, that one will automatically give you at least 5% revenue boost like overnight. You install the app, right? You basically get 5% increase. So you should probably try that. Uh, the other one is Clavio. I think it's quite, uh, you've heard a lot of people with Clavio. Yeah. Uh, email marketing, very important. Uh, to be fair, it's quite expensive. Clavio is expensive, but they are like $10 billion company. They have a lot of investors and stuff. So it's not going to go down. And uh, email marketing is like super important. You can generate like 30, 50% 50, 50 more in revenue overnight per se. And you have no ad spanner. So compared to a guy who's like doing uh, one mil ref per year, you basically have like 300K in free cash flow just to play with. So very, very powerful stuff. All right. And uh, so I would, uh, as we're, we're about to wrap this up, and so this would be a good time to remind the audience to go uh, check out your website. I think there it uh, it describes all of them, gives them a sense of um, how to put all those together. And then my question about uh, COGS also came from your blog as well. So uh, that's also a, a handy resource to check out as well. So um, with that, the, the, the last thing that I want to talk about is very open-ended, just more about... Um, uh, for 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 your point of view and you know your your aspirations is um, you know how do you how do you see things uh, unfolding for you do you have um, uh, uh, visions of like maybe uh, expanding or I guess overall just how are things going with you it's the kind of question oh. that people usually start <laughs> with okay. but sure. yeah I'm just gonna let it, I'm just gonna ask it now just while we uh, wrap this up uh, recently I've been uh, it's a bit different. So it's like, I run an agency. I, I, we still want to run uh, the agency and stuff. Uh, but we realized it's like, uh, we are really good, uh, like marketing partner per se. So I like, recently like take an equity with some brands and it's like, okay, we run the entire marketing show. We take an equity in two to three years time, right? Let's see whether we can exit at like crazy multiples, right? So it's like, okay, we, uh, you got a product already. It works. Uh, we know it can sell. We just take that and then we just latch on our marketing team, go to you and just like steroids all the way. Yeah. So uh, in a sense, that's kind of what, uh, I'm looking to, to be a bit like agency owner, but also like, cause every single day we just do marketing. So it's like, it's just bread and butter for us. Right. So uh, we're taking the expertise and then bring it into uh, brands. And then we try to do the big boy route, like private equity and finance per se, sell out to that. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously I'm sitting here <laughs> now uh, in 2021, not having been able to do that yet, but uh, probably in like 18 months down the road, then we'll see what happens. Yeah. Door will, uh, as long as there's a door to open, it will be open. So always happy to have you back and uh, and and update us on, on how things are going. And um, it, you know, it, it, some of it, some of it is uh, is per perspective too, right? I mean, you're saying you know working with the big boys, whereas I'm having this conversation with you. I'm like, oh, it's to me, you know, where you're at. No, is no, also, no. <laughs> yeah. Joseph, in in like three months, you give yourself like three months, right? You can hit like 30, 50 k per month really easily. Don't worry. 
You got it. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, 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 if I, I'm being transparent. Uh, I could, I could be a little bit more um, uh, expedited about this, but yeah, you know, um, uh, one, uh, one step at a time for me. So there's, a, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. So uh, final thing is, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I want to make uh, returning guests do the whole like words of wisdom thing. I think one time is enough. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, with uh, with that said, just uh, let the audience know once more how they can find you, check you, check your writing, check your content, even get in touch with you. Uh, go to oxg-media.com. If you want to go to the opt-in, you can just slash process. So it's oxg-media.com slash process. Yeah, if you want to book a call with us, uh, you can just book a call. It's either me or one of my team members who speak to you. Uh, and then we can see whether we can help you or not, right? We're not going to take you on uh, if you can't help you. So mm -hmm. don't worry. Uh, but if we can, then yes, we're going to sell something to you. So yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right. Well, um, th that's everything that we've got for today. So to my audience, um, thank you all for participating in your own way. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to collect this information, use it for my own good, and then also share it for all of you as well. So with that, one more thank you to Jonathan Ung for the road. And we will check in soon. And we all realize that, wow, you know, everyone's doing e-commerce these days. Hey, this is Joseph from Ecomonics. Just wanted to thank you for being here and for giving this content your time and attention. I hope you learned something. I can say with certainty, I have learned something with every episode that I have done, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There's a couple of things you can do to help us out. If you want to check out the audio content, we are available on all major podcast platform distributors. And while you're there, give us a five-star review. It helps a lot. And while you're here on YouTube, there's a lot of things you can do to help out as well. It's not going to take very long. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button for this episode, and hit the notification bell. So when we have new content for you, it's going to be at your doorstep ASAP. Lastly, this podcast is created by Debutify, the best Shopify template available. It is 100% free for you to start, and it can change your life. It can make you so much more free than you are right now. So if this episode wasn't enough to convince you, I think a few more might do the trick. So have at it.